The Chocolate Touch, Chapter 2 It was Sunday afternoon. The sun was sinking low in the sky, but the air was still quite warm. John was wandering along in the direction of Susan's house, absent-mindedly looking down at the sidewalk, when his eye was suddenly caught by a dually gleaming silvery gray coin lying right in his path. The coin was the size of a quarter, but even as he leaned forward eagerly to pick it up, John noticed there was something strange about it. It did not have a picture of George Washington or a picture of an eagle. On one side there was a picture of a fat boy, and on the other side were the letters J.M. Which was funny, John thought, because those letters happened to be his initials. Grasping the coin firmly, he ran on towards Susan's house. She liked to collect things. He thought she might be interested to know that he had the beginning of a coin collection. Although he was in the habit of going over to Susan's by the same route once or twice almost every day, this afternoon, John found himself turning left, where he usually turned right. I always go the same way, he thought, this time for a change. I'm going a new way. He didn't stop to consider that you cannot go east by going west unless you go all the way around the world. Only two blocks along the unfamiliar street, John came to a small corner store. It was a neat red brick building with two big show windows. They were full of all sorts of candy. Susan was immediately, absolutely forgotten. John pressed his nose against one of the windows. He was imagining the taste of the chocolate-covered almonds and chocolate fudge on the other side of the glass when he noticed a man in a white apron standing behind the counter and beckoning on him. John was surprised. He hadn't expected the store to be open on Sunday. Don't just stand there in the doorway, John, the man called heartily. Come on in. And get some fresh, sweet, creamy chocolate. There's a special sale today. How did the man know his name? John wondered. He couldn't remember ever having seen the store before. The storekeeper saw John hesitate. The chocolate I use in my kitchen comes direct from the heart of Africa, he said. I use none but the finest ingredients and in my recipes. Well, I bet you never had chocolate like mine before. Come on in. Thank you, John replied, walking to the counter. But you see, the trouble is, well, no money, the storekeeper asked. No money whatsoever? What have you got there in your right hand? John had forgotten the old coin in his hand. Oh, he said, this is part of my coin collection. I mean, he had it more honestly. I'm going to save the coin and then get some more to make a collection. Let me have a look at it, the storekeeper said. He looked briefly at the coin. Aha, he exclaimed. Is it any good? John asked, his hopes suddenly rising. Very good, said the storekeeper. In fact, it's the only kind of money I accept. But I don't suppose that you'd want to spend it on a box. A whole box? I imagined you'd rather keep this for your coin collection than spend it on chocolate, wouldn't you? Oh no, John said. Chocolate any day. Go ahead then, help yourself, the storekeeper said, pointing to a heavy ladle, show, laden shown table, piled high with large cellophane wrapped candy boxes, all exactly alike. You mean I can have one of those? John asked, his eyes round with surprise. The candy boxes were as big as the ones his father always brought home at Christmas time. Just help yourself, the storekeeper assured him. That is, unless you think it might be better to ask your mother first. She wouldn't mind. John said hastily and blushed. The storekeeper winked knowingly. I'm sure she won't, he agreed. Not in the long run, anyway. John tucked one of the large boxes under his arm, declined the storekeeper's offer to wrap it as a gift, thanked him, and hurried out of the store before there could be any question of anyone's changing his mind. The storekeeper smiled as he watched his customer hurrying away down the street. John decided that it might be sensible to enter his home quietly by the way of the kitchen. With the large candy box hidden behind him, he let himself in by the back door and crept up the kitchen stairway on tiptoe 
toward his own room on the top floor. Just as he was about to round the corner on the second floor to continue his way upstairs, he had to stop for a moment while his father walked by, coming along the hall from the bedroom telephone. That was Mrs. Buttercup on the phone, Mr. Midas called to Mrs. Midas, and he walked down the front stairs. She said she was sorry John hadn't been able to get over to play with Susan this afternoon. But it was a good thing in a way, she thought, because Susan's already so excited about her birthday party tomorrow. I wonder where John can have got to. As soon as the second floor was quiet again, and John knew there was no danger that his candy box would be seen, he hurried silently up to his bedroom, pushed open the door, and slid the box under his bed. Then he walked heavily down to the living room. "'Well, there you are,' said Mrs. Midas. "'We couldn't imagine where you had been. "'What have you been doing?' "'Oh, just sort of playing around,' John said. John usually took a long time to put his things away and undress and bathe and get ready for bed, for he thought sleeping was a waste of time. But this evening he started yawning long before his usual bedtime. "'Ho, oh, hum, oh, hum, sleepy,' John announced." All right, said Mrs. Midas, you better be getting to bed. Time for your tonic. John's tonic came in a bottle. It had been prescribed by Dr. Cranium. John had to drink a big spoonful every night to make up for all the vegetables and fruit that he left on his plate at dinner and lunch. The tonic tasted like soap, mud, glue, ink, and paint. It tasted horrible. Much to Mrs. Midas' surprise, John ran ahead of her to the dining room cupboard where the tonic and the tonic spoon were kept. By the time she got there, he had already filled the spoon. Then, within, without any coaxing, he emptied it into his mouth. Ugh! John spluttered. Ugh! Barf! That's a very good boy, Mrs. Midas said. Now why don't you be sensible and eat up your nice dinner that way? If you'd only stop eating so much candy, you'd be able to eat your meals properly and you wouldn't need to take the tonic. Soon, John was scrubbed and in his pajamas and in bed, ready to be tucked in for the night. Mrs. Midas sat on the bed and stroked his forehead for a moment. Then she leaned forward and kissed his cheek. John, pretending that he was very sleepy, shut his eyes and began breathing deeply. When Mrs. Midas rejoined Mr. Midas in the living room, she said, I've never known John to be so good about going to bed before. He went to sleep in no time. A few seconds after the bedroom door had closed behind his mother, John leaped to the floor, got down on his hands and knees, and felt under the bed for the candy box. He soon had it on the pillow and sat up to work, unfastening it. First, he took off the thin outer sheet of cellophane. Then he lifted off the lid. Then he removed a sheet of cardboard. Then he pulled off a square of heavy tin foil. Then he took out a layer of shredded paper. And the wrapping piled up around him. John became rather anxious. At let last he came to a small central ball of cotton batting and there right in the middle was a little golden ball he picked up the ball with his fingernail and peeled away the gold paper revealing a tiny piece of plain chocolate it was the only piece of chocolate in the whole box deeply disappointed john nevertheless put it into his mouth he had never tasted a chocolate quite like it it was the most chocolatey chocolate he had ever encountered and that is the end of the Chocolate Touch Chapter 2. If you like my channel, you can like and subscribe below. And remember, there's other books you can listen to while I read as well.